Hi everybody and welcome to AFSA's Diplomats at Work, where we talk to active duty diplomats about work and life in the U.S. Foreign Service. So today we're going to be talking to Andrew Byerly, who is an econ officer at U.S. Embassy in Riga, Latvia. But we're going to be talking to him about his time as a consular officer when he was serving at the U.S. Embassy in Belize, uh, a post that he said was one of the toughest uh, of his career thus far. Um, welcome, Andrew. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. And I know it's kind of late for you, so I really appreciate you uh, dialing in. What are you, seven hours ahead? Yes, it's 8 p.m., a little after 8 p.m. here. Well, thank you for your service and for your dedication. <laughs> so, okay, um, let's start off uh, today's program a little bit differently than we normally do, which is let's talk about how you got into the Foreign Service. Um, I feel like your path was maybe a little unusual for a Foreign Service. You started off studying engineering, which is really an interesting, um, I guess, an interesting thing to study if you have a a plan to do a career in the foreign service or foreign affairs. So tell yeah. us more about that. I mean, to start, I, I never had a plan to enter the, the foreign affairs field. It, you know, I studied engineering in school and I, I started with the Department of State as an engineer in the foreign service. And if you're like me about 13 years ago, wondering what does the Department of State need engineers for? <laughs> there are a few different flavors of engineer you can be in the foreign service. What I did was a security engineer for our diplomatic security service. So all over the world, there are engineers stationed who are kind of installing, maintaining, designing the security systems in the embassies to make sure that everyone is safe and secure inside. Uh, another type of engineer you can be, which is what my, my wife is, is a facility manager. So uh, we met engineering school. She's a mechanical engineer as well. And she maintains the building systems and the building grounds on the compound to make sure that, that everything is functioning. And there's a third type of engineer you can be uh, a construction engineer for our Office of Overseas Building Operations. Those are the folks mm -hmm. who, whenever the Department of State is building a new building or a new compound or whatever, the construction engineers are assigned abroad and they are overseeing the construction project. So I started out as a security engineer. Um, I found out about the, the job at a career fair actually in Georgia Tech in Atlanta. I was walking around trying to find someone to hire me and I saw a booth with the Department of State. And I thought, what does the Department of State need engineers for? And I went and talked to him <laughs> with a, a since retired security engineer and telling me about how you know, you're gonna get to travel with the Secretary of State. You're gonna be installing these systems, state of the art, yada, yada, yada. And he hooked me. Uh, Sign so me up. Tests, yeah, <laughs> passed all their tests and did their interviews. And I ended up serving a two-year tour in Washington um, for training and working with our folks there. And then I served for two years in Dakar, Senegal as a security engineer, kind of maintaining our security systems all over West Africa. Um, but at this point in time, my around at the end of my time in Dakar, my wife was looking to be hired as a facility manager. She was kind of in that process. And we knew it was going to be very difficult to be assigned to a, a, a country together that was going to have two engineers. That's a pretty rare thing. Mm. And I was starting to get interested in some of the policy pieces. And I thought, yeah, I wonder if I could maybe try the FSO route. So there's a program called the Mustang program, where if you're already like a State Department specialist, like I was, um, you, can, you can take the test and do your essays and do the oral assessments. And then if you pass all that, they put you on the register and kick you in day 100. So that is my roundabout way on how I got to become a foreign service officer. Wow, that is really, um, that is very interesting. I don't know that I've heard many stories. Uh, I know stories of that journey. People, yeah, who, who went from security engineering officer to FSOs. Wow, wow. Yeah. well, that's, that's impressive. And you studied robotics, right? So that's yeah, even more, I don't know how many robotics <laughs> security engineers made it into FSO. Well, that's great. So, uh, you finished a couple, so you finished one tour in Senegal as a DS. Um, and then once you converted to FSO, um, then you had to do a year or two years of consular as a consular officer. And that's something I didn't know. And I don't know how many of those in the audience today uh, may be aware that every foreign service officer has to do at least one tour 
um, as a consular officer before beginning or as they begin their career. So tell us yeah, more about that. Exactly. Um, you know, I think the, the important piece to note to start is that if you talk to any foreign service officer abroad, any ambassador, anyone who works at an embassy and you ask, what are you guys doing out there? What are your goals? The number one thing anyone is going to say is that the, the embassy's primary responsibility is, is the safety and security of U.S. citizens in country, and that's consular services. So, you know, serving as a consular officer is incredibly important to the United States foreign mission. And to, you know, to highlight that, the, you know, as, as you were hired in and you're an, entry, you're an entry level officer, Department of State, usually you do two entry level tours. Um, more than likely, at least, at least one of those is going to be a consular tour, a two year consular mm -hmm. tour. There are some situations where you would just do like a, you could be assigned to Belize, for example, and do a rotation, like I'll do one year consular and one year public account, but those are pretty rare. I mean, there are a lot of FSOs who, who are not consular coned who do two, you know, four, four total years of consular work, so two tours. Um, it all depends on the needs of the service. Um, you know, after COVID, you know, the, the passport loads were insanely high, visa loads were insanely high, so we needed more consular officers. So there were more of those positions opened up, they needed more bodies, and, um, you know, they needed folks to go and, and serve and, and, and kind of hit those important points. Um, yeah, so, you know, my, my first assignment was, was directed as an FSO to Belize. And, um, you know, whenever I was in the consular section there, we were a relatively small operation. When I was there, we had like, I think, four FSOs, including our boss. And a consular section has, has three distinct pillars. You have your non-immigrant visas, like your tourist visas, and people who are mm -hmm. just traveling to the U.S. temporarily. Your immigrant visas, which are people who are going to be immigrating to move permanently to the United States. And then you have American citizen services, mm -hmm. which is going to be like your passports, uh, your births, your deaths, and things like that. Um, so being that it was a small embassy, I was lucky enough that I got to rotate into each of those sections for you know a third of my tour uh, to really kind of get the full spectrum of what consular work is like. Yeah. So speaking of Belize, um, and and we'll get into the the story. I know that you had a particularly sort of tough uh, tough time, tough month in Belize. But before we get into that, um, I maybe set a, the sort of picture for us or paint a picture for us of Belize. And it's kind of I don't know if it's an unusual pose, but. Um, there is a lot more work maybe for the consular officers in Belize than maybe an average post. And so maybe just explain Belize to those of us who haven't been. Yeah, so, you know, Belize is very, very close to the United States. It's on the Yucatan yeah. Peninsula. Um, very short flight out of Miami and Houston whenever I was there. There's probably more direct flights now. It's also English speaking. It's one of the, mm. maybe the only, you know, English speaking country in the Central America Isthmus. Um, so given that it is so close, it's tropical, beautiful country, um, a lot of vacations, a lot of Americans flying down and I love my fellow American, but my fellow American can do some dumb things on vacation. So like uh, lose passports or, <laughs> well, you know, other things? it ran the gamut in, in Belize. It, people lose passports all over the world. Belize was, was no different. There are a lot of retirees in Belize yeah. who, you know, who would pass. Um, people would give birth in Belize, um, and there's also people when they, you know, break the law, get thrown in jail. That requires consular officer action. Um, so I, you know, I think that the consular work, get, given the size of the embassy, which is relatively small as far as embassies go in the world, you know, the consular work was quite intense, mostly because of the the American citizen, visitor, traveler, resident in Belize. Yeah. Um, okay, so now to to talk a little bit about your experience in Belize. Um, I've heard you talk about this before. I know that there was uh, one month in particular that was super intense for you and you sort of experienced the gamut of what uh, American citizen services kind of can be called to, to do or to provide. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think I want to take a step back as well, uh, tell a story of my first day in the office. So I wasn't yeah. scheduled 
do ACS work, like American citizen services work, um, right from the get-go. I was going to be doing non-immigrant visas. Um, but like day one, I'm like introducing myself to everyone and we get a phone call from the airport because a 16 year old American had gone through airport security with a, a bag of marijuana in his pocket. And they, they said the embassy, you know, the airport's like an hour and a half away from the embassy because the capital's inland and all that kind of stuff. So like, Andrew, welcome. We need you to hop back in the car, and <laughs> get over to the airport and talk to this kid and see what's going on, try to help him out. And so I went back over there and, you know, it was just kind of a testament to my being so green. The, uh, the airport security official wanted me to like sign a letter taking over custody of the person, which I know I, I signed it. I should not have. I should not have. But <laughs> I did sign this letter and I was like, yes, I'll take control of the American and I'll take the pot out of his pocket and put him on a plane and we'll throw it away or, you know, whatever. Um, but, but that's just kind of the, the craziness of, you know, you had your day planned. We're going to do these appointments. We're going to do these, these interviews, these passports, and, you know, and this is how our day is going to be. And anything can drop in you at any moment. Um, so, you know, in, in, in Belize, there's a very large, uh, American retiree community, and it is not uncommon for Americans to die in Belize. Yeah. Um, what is uncommon is for younger Americans to die in Belize, and also for 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 us, the consular officers there, to make what we call the initial next of kin notification. Mm -hmm. So you know, traditionally, you know, people are. This is the day of the internet. Nothing happens without someone knowing instantaneously. Um, so if someone were to get in an accident or get into a, you know, they need to go to the hospital or they're arrested, normally their friends would call their, their family and be like, oh, hey, you know, your, your son has been arrested or has passed away and things like that. So it's insanely rare for consular officers to kind of do those calls. But there was one month in, in Belize where there, we had two Americans die who were young and it was, you know, one was a murder and one was what we've probably akin to like a manslaughter accidental mm -hmm. but still fault involved. That sounds awful. Yeah. Um, you know, the, so you're going about your day and then the next thing you know, you get a call from the police. So counter mm -hmm. officers are always going to have generally are going to have great relationships with the local police because the, the, they're going to, the police are going to, you know, they're going to, if it's a death, they're going to search the body to try to find identification and they're going to call the embassy to try to verify that ID. So they call us and they say, hey, we think we have an American. Um, it was, a, a, I think it was 17 at the time who, who was, was killed. And I, I don't want to get into specifics for yeah. you know, obvious reasons. But, um, you know, so we asked the police, like, have you talked to the family yet? And they're like, no, we, we don't know who to call. This, this person appears to be alone. The Belizeans that, that, you, that he was traveling with don't know, don't know about his family members. So, you know, I, we, I was doing AC at American Citizen Services uh, work at this time. So we get into the, we log into our system. We have a big database that we can kind of to log into to find everyone's old passport applications. And there's a, a box on the passport application that says next of kin. And where everyone has to write down who, who gets called yeah. or something happens. And thankfully, this person did actually put down information there. It ended up being his mother. Oh, God. So uh, we, we have privacy booths in the embassy where we can kind of take very sensitive cases. So I kind mm -hmm. of go into the privacy booth and I get into a headspace where I know we're going to have to do this. This is the first time I had ever had to, to make a call like this. Dial up the phone. And the woman picks up and I hear road noise. I can hear that she's like driving on the highway. And, you know, immediately I, I flash back to our, our consular officer training where they're like, look, if you have to make these difficult calls, if you believe someone is driving, you need to ask them to pull over to make sure that they're not going to, you know, do anything to hurt themselves or other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you identify yourself as, as, a, as a consular officer calling from the embassy in which your family member is traveling. It's almost never good. It can't be good news, yeah. Ma'am, please, can you, I think you're driving. Are you driving? Can you please pull over? And you can't pull over immediately on a highway. So there's this tense moment of back and forth. I'm like, why are you calling? What is this? And you have to just kind of wait mm -hmm. and say, I'm sorry, just please pull over. And so, you know, finally get to a point and, and you know, I introduced myself again, identified myself, and I said, I'm sorry, man. Your, your son has died. And I, I will, will never in my life forget just the, 
the emotional reaction and just kind of cries that came to the other side of the phone yeah. that day. Um, and, you know, that's something that sticks with me, but it's not unique to me. I mean, consular officers all over the world are, are doing these kinds yeah. of things. It was just my turn. Um, but, you know, back, back to the story there, at this point in time, you know, the, the family, she's you know, obviously insane, incredibly upset. Um, so we, we kind of offer and say, look, there's lots of process. I tell her the kind of details that, mm -hmm. that what we know, which is not much because the police have just called us. They haven't done an investigation or anything. We just know that, that the person's dead. And so usually we'll give this person an opportunity to call us back and say, look, take some time, talk to your family. You can call us, your family can call us. And, and, then, and then we go from there. Um, you know, in situations of a death, you know, things that an embassy does where we, we, we put the, the family in touch with the police if need be, mm -hmm. if they're in an investigation. The embassy does not want to, to serve as, as like, like kind of the, the middle, the middle man, the middle people to, um, kind of slow communication down. And we also put the, the, the deceased family in touch with like the coroner. Um, because the United States has very strict regulations on how, how bodies can come back in. And in Belize, that, that whenever I was serving there, there was only one or two coroners who could, who could actually do that. So we had to make sure they were in touch with the right people so there was no issues at the port of entry where the body was going to come back in. Um, so that's kind of you know, how, how a, a death case works. Um, so I'm, the, what I'm kind of describing takes place over a matter of, of weeks, depending on the, the mm -hmm. police investigation and things like that. Um, so you know, as this case is going on, you know, just a matter of days later, we get another another call from the police that a an American woman was was murdered. Uh, at this point, I'm going to use the word murdered. It wasn't even a question of of accidental death. And it was the same thing. It was a, she was a solo traveler, just kind of enjoying her time in Belize and was in the wrong place at the wrong time, it would seem. And, you know, the place didn't know how to get a hold of her family. So they came to us and left it to us to call. So I kind of did the same thing, looked up the passport application, found next of kin, um, and made the same type of call to this woman's father. Mm -hmm. and got the same kind of reaction. Um, and work through the, the same process. And it's, it's, a, it's an emotional <laughs> process. It, yeah. you know, you're trying to be a, a, you know, a, a bureaucrat in, in, the, the bad, in the bad sense, but you're trying to be a you know, government official. You want yeah. to stay calm and poised. And then, and then you, you put the phone down, you can finally take a moment to you know, process your own feelings and emotions to get through that because, you know, waiting on the other side of this phone call or a bunch of people out in the waiting room who, who need to talk to you to the passports or, or maybe they had a birth in the family and, you know, they're looking to do their consular report of birth. Um, so, you know, the, the, the days are varied, um, but, you know, in a lot of these situations, department's really good about, you know, giving you the support you need if you need to talk to someone. You know, I had an amazing boss, in Belize who checked in on me and, you know, understood what was going on, had done things like this herself and, you know, made sure I had the support I needed to be able to, you know, bounce back and, and get back to where we needed. Yeah. You had talked about um, consular training that it sort of helped prepare you, it sounds yeah. like, for this. What, can you tell us more about what that entails? Yeah, that's uh, what we call CONGEN. C O N G. I don't know what it stands. Consular general training, probably not. I yeah. don't know. Someone out there will know. Um, yeah, but it, it's you know whenever whenever you're first hired by the the government to be a foreign service officer for your the first time you go to do something overseas, you get that job's trade craft. So when I first went overseas as an econ officer, I got econ trade craft or political trade craft, and those are usually like you know maybe three weeks or so long. How to be a reporting officer, write cables, talk to people, things like that. Consular, congen, that's a full, when I did it, God, it was six or eight weeks. It might even be longer now, I'm not sure. But it's a full training because consular officers have to be familiar with the with immigration laws. Yeah. Have to study those things, there's actual tests we have to pass because to, to be a consular officer abroad, you have to have 
what's called a consular commission. So you have to be like officially approved to go do these things. Mm. Not anyone in the embassy can just can just go down and talk to Americans and do passports or visas. It takes a very special, um, you know, certified officer to do that. And to get that certification is Kanjin. So Kanjin similarly is broken up into kind of those three pillars I described previously, the non-immigrant visa training, immigrant visa training, which all, you know, we're a, we're a fun bureaucracy. There's umpteen levels of different visas for every type of thing you want to do. So yeah. be familiar with all those, how to adjudicate those, how to interview people for those, what kind of paperwork you need, where do we sign, where do they sign, what's legal, what's not. And then it's also kind of the same piece on the American citizen services side where you're learning how to, how to, how to do passports. Um, what's it like whenever an American comes in and, and because they, they believe they passed on citizenship to their, to their child that was born abroad. So you kind of work through those things, deaths. And, and part of the, the process of Kanjin is, uh, is kind of, is role playing. Um, which is kind of what I mentioned, I flash back to the, yeah. you know, the, the day we did role playing for these next of kin notifications. And, you know, you, you try to take it seriously, you know, you, you try to be a grieving widow on the side of the phone to help your colleague learn these things, but there's nothing like doing it in the moment. But it's, it's, I mean, it's probably some of the best training I've had at the Department of State was, was Congen because it's very thorough and they do, it forces you to think about, you know, how are you going to react to that human being that's yeah. on the other side of your window, be it for a visa or concerts, people come up and they're, they're combative, or maybe they're really shy and they're not good at telling their story. And you need to make sure you need to kind of pull that out of them. Um, you know, it's very effective to make sure that, you know, once you get abroad and you're, you're a consular officer, you're, you're able to hit the ground running. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like it's sort of a mix of psychology and empathy and obviously immigration law. I, I don't I always thought if I were on the visa line, I'd probably give everybody a visa because I felt so bad for, it's, <laughs> for you know, the stories. In, in, in Belize, there's, you know, every, every country kind of has their like refusal rates and you in, in, the embassy is constantly evaluating they're doing studies and analysis on the visas they gave last year. So, you know, D, you know, the U.S. Department of State gives the visas, but DHS is tracking how people yeah. use it for the most part. So DHS will kind of give us our data back, and then it's up to the embassy to, to analyze it and to look for trends. So you're kind of taking the demographics of, like, this specific demographic of traveler, they seem to be abusing their visa, um, you know. So we, maybe we need to give that demographic fewer visas but you know this demographic that we've been refusing a lot of visas to the ones that we gave the ones that did receive a visa were actually really good travelers maybe we need to in you know increase the amount of visas we're giving to these folks so the consular officer you're constantly reevaluating you have this model in your head on what like what is like the good the good traveler to america and um Sorry, someone did this on the mock jail. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, um, you know, you're constantly reevaluating these um, these cases in your head, and it is so my very first tour was going to Belize. But people who do multiple consular tours, you know, they have to get accustomed and kind of when they get to their new assignment, they have to kind of shut down and kind of you know put aside what was a good traveler in my previous post because now I'm here. So they have to relearn what, what are the demographics, what are the travel patterns to make sure that when I'm doing these interviews, I'm, I'm you, know, you know, being a good steward of, of our visas. Yeah. So we talked about all the things that an embassy or um, American Citizen Services can do. Um, so help with certifying uh, births and unfortunately deaths and everything in between. What are the things that um, an embassy cannot do to help an American in a, in a tough spot tough or. Spot. I would, yeah, I'd say one of the, one of the most common requests I had in, in Belize that I had to kind of explain or say no to was like, can you get me out of jail? Mm. Um, you can't do that. Can't, I can't do it. Not yet. We'll see. <laughs> um, but you know, 
it was kind of the cognitive dissonance maybe of, of American traveling to Belize, but only being on a plane for like an hour. They didn't realize they really weren't an American anymore. They're, and so everyone speaks calling, English, I guess. Yeah. 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 So, you know, they were, there are things that are legal in America. They're not legal in Belize. And so oh. people get arrested or pulled over and ticket or put in jail. And it's like, I'm an American. I'm an American. It doesn't count for me. And it's, it's, no, when you, when you are in Belize, you have to follow Belizean laws. And, you know, when Americans are, are arrested abroad, one of, one of the things that a consular officer will do is visit them in the jail to make sure they're being treated fairly and they have what they need. And I've, um, I've done those visits. Uh, um, you know, a lot of times the Americans would kind of maybe get placed in holding and they would go to court very quickly and they would get released and we wouldn't need to go. It was kind of a, a bar. If they were going to be in jail for longer than a certain X number of days, we would go visit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm kind of flashing back to one, there was one person who I visited in jail who was insane, was very paranoid that, that he was being like followed and tracked by the United States government. So I had glasses oh. then and a button down shirt. He, he made me take my glasses off and he, he insisted that I, I take my shirt off because I had, there were cameras in my buttons. So I had a convincing, like, why, you know, we had, had to talk through the situation of like, why, you know, why would I do that? Why would I be here? So the guy just started kind of rationalizing as like, I'm here to help you. I want to get you what you need. Here's our list of lawyers. You know, I'm not, there's nothing for me to record. And, you know, so, you know, that was the, the, the first situation where I had kind of a, normally people are very happy to see me at the jail. <laughs> this was the first time they yeah. used to see me, the American official. And so it was, it was a good exercise in kind of talking to a combative person and trying to talk them down a little bit, to calm them down to explain what it is we do, how I can help them, what next steps may be for them. Um, but yeah, those are just the kind of- I'm just picturing a State Department cool. official without a shirt on trying to help us. Yeah, I did, I did not take my shirt off. Uh, I, I, I did take my glasses off for him because I can still see a little bit, but yeah, the shirt had to stay on. So what can you do to help someone in jail? You gave them a list of lawyers, but you can't tell them which lawyer, right? You can just exactly. sort of give a, a list, bring them something to read, maybe to pass the time. Yeah, if they're going to be there for a while, we can, we can try to help them get into, so, I mean, United States citizens have, um, have rights to, to privacy. So we have the United States Privacy Act. So we are, you know, we consular officers, U.S. government officials are not allowed to talk to anyone about a U.S. citizen without that U.S. citizen's permission to do so. Mm. So, you know, if they're having trouble getting hold, getting a hold of their family from the jail, you know, in the United States, yeah. wherever the case may be, one thing we can do is get them to, to sign a Privacy Act waiver that says that I grant the U.S. government permission to talk to mm. mom or dad or my friend. And so once that happens, we can go back and we can make some phone calls to share information about the case. Um, a lot of times it might be a situation of paying a fine. So if we can get if we can get this American citizen who's in jail in touch with their family so they can wire down money for the fine, that can get them out of jail more quickly mm -hmm. than they go into to court and, and things like that. So you know we will do everything we can within the confines of the law to, to get to get them out, including helping make phone calls. You know, we make sure that they have the medical treatment we need, you know. Belize still a developing country. The the jails were were not you know up to American standards. I would say, so there are situations where you know, are you getting your medication? Do we do you need more of it? Do are you being treated fairly? And you have mm -hmm. food, water, and things like that. So those are the kind of things that when when a when a consular officer is visiting a jail, those are the things that we're kind of looking out for. So you're you know, you're asking the person about that to get their take, but you're also kind of, you know, you're looking around and you see, oh, okay, I, I think this bird's treated fairly. I don't hear him or her getting yelled at in the background before I come in or things like that. Okay. So then outside of um, uh, an arrest situation, are there other things that an embassy cannot do? This is uh, asking for a friend. I was like, there's a kind of do, man, I, mean, I think <laughs> the list of things that an embassy can do is probably shorter than the, I think they can do. Uh, you know, we, I have a lot of requests because a lot of embassies will have like Marines, Marine security guards, you know, I've heard kind of jokingly, but also seriously, like send in the Marines, like, mm -hmm. like every a helicopter or something, we're just going to like mount up and then fly out there. But that's not at all the case. And the Marines are there to protect, um, ensure the safety and security of the, the, the American embassy compound itself. So the Marines yeah. rarely leave 
that that compound. So that's one other request. Um, you know, things that an embassy can do outside of the consular world, you know, there are economic things. I've done economic and commercial work. So if you're a U.S. citizen who is, um, you know, have a, have a business abroad or you're trying to engage and do business yeah. in, in a different country, you can, you know, always reach out to the, you know, get on the embassy's website, find the email address, reach out to the, the commercial officer. Um, you know, embassies are always, always interested to hear if those who are trying to do business are having trouble. One yeah. of the things we want to try to do in an embassy is facilitate, um, you know, commercial ties between countries. So if there, if we get multiple folks reporting the same thing, we can kind of put together trends to see, you know, maybe maybe the embassy can can kind of put some of its political effort into fixing this business and economic thing that makes it easier for people to do business. And you know, it's easier to do business. More tourists are coming. That's tied back into the the council work so it's all you know one big mission so that um nicely transitions to my next question which is about your work right now as an econ officer but before we do that uh, whatever happened with that kid who got arrested with the pot at the airport uh, yeah so i, I <laughs> promptly you left me hanging on that and, <laughs> and kind of you know, we went outside the airport i was like man you gotta you gotta not do that please going forward um, we, we had a good relationship with, uh, the airline. So we called the airline and we were able to get his, his, cause he missed his flight, get him kind of rebooked. No, no charge, um, on the next plane back into the United States and hopefully in the school, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't hear about it. <laughs> oh my, okay. So then next question, um, you are now an econ officer in uh, the U.S. Embassy in Riga, yes. and um, I'd like to hear more about what you do there, and also maybe talk a little bit about how the experience doing consular work, especially, it sounds like the, the time in Belize really uh, helped you grow, maybe emotionally, I don't know, um, if that somehow impacted your work today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say reflecting back on my, my time in Belize, I, it is still, you know, all these years later, the most difficult, that period of time is the most difficult thing yeah. I've ever had to do at work. Um, and just in, in life in general, it kind of instilled in me the idea that everyone's going through something, having yeah. empathy for, you know, be it work or abroad or outside, you know, work or play, um, you know, be nice to people. <laughs> Um, but you know, professionally doing consular work where Belize, and I also did a little bit of consular work in my next assignment in the Lock Chop Martinia. Um, it's insanely important just to, to a, a foreign service officer, a diplomat understanding the mission kind of, of, mm -hmm. of the United States government. Um, you know, you, I can, I'm an econ officer now. I can propose we do all the things business and econ commercial related, but like if the situation is not good for American citizen and country, that's gonna be the focus mm -hmm. first. So I'm not gonna be able to do my job unless the embassy itself is able to make, to ensure the safety and security of Americans in whatever the host country is. So it's, and kind of, as I said, the, every embassy has um, what's called an integrated country strategy. It's a document we do every few years. It kind of lists out what are the mission's goals and goal zero, A, one up top is always consular work, protection of Americans. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important for everyone across the board in embassy to keep in mind. Um, you know, more specifically, consular, or I'm sorry, economic work. So I, I whenever I was in Wachcha, Mauritania, um, I did consular work and I was the economic and commercial officer there. Um, and then now I'm in Riga, Latvia and I'm doing economic and commercial work only. I, I do not, I no longer have a consular commission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time on, on commercial issues. So we're, we're trying to help U.S. companies do business. Um, if there's, you know, one thing that, that, I, that I've been working on this week is there's a, a, you know, a new public tender where the, the, the Latvian government wants to kind of basically contract a company to install this new system. Well, I'd love to see an American company get that contract. Mm -hmm. So working with American companies to make sure that they can, um, 
they can bid successfully, make sure they understand the kind of like the lobbying context. We can kind of do that for companies who may want to think about, oh, maybe I want to enter the Baltic or the Latvian market. What's it like? What's that Latvian consumer and things like that? Um, so that's kind of like the, the commercial economic piece. The other thing, you know, is is econ political and economic officers, you know, primarily kind of our the meat and potatoes of our portfolios are we are reporting officers. Mm -hmm. So we are writing what we call cables, reports back to Washington, D.C. about the situation um, in, in country. So, you know, my, my portfolios personally include um, kind of China and Taiwan piece. So I watch that closely here in Latvia. I have the commercial, um, the commercial aspect. And more recently, I, I've also adopted the, kind of the cyberspace and digital portfolio which is something I'm super excited to do because as an engineer, yeah. <laughs> just to be able to kind of dip my, my toes back into the, the technical side. Um, you know, there's, the United States government is engaging at these, you know, standards forms, talking about, you know, how do we beam internet from satellites down to the, to earth? And there, I would venture to say, not a lot of diplomats who understand technology behind how that works, even though they're advocating for those policies. I, I'm lucky enough that I do understand those kinds of things. So, um, you know, I'm definitely looking to kind of bolster that portfolio, um, you know, based on my background here in, in Latvia. Oh, that's great. And see why it's important to have engineers come into the foreign service. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, those are all the questions for me. And so I'm going to switch now to the questions that we've been receiving from our uh, audience. If you just don't mind me um, taking a second to scroll through. Okay, I have, uh, I have a number of questions. So I'll try to get through as many as possible. And they may be a little bit all over the place, but um, I think it'll provide for a good kind of color. Um, so number one, uh, how is your foreign service experience different than what you expected it to be? I'm guessing it's very different than you expected it to be in some ways. Uh, whenever I, for, I, you know, I never, in a, I grew up in Indiana. I never in a million years thought that I would be like working overseas as a diplomat. I didn't even know it existed, honestly, honestly, through college. I went to, you know, undergraduate engineering school in Indiana. And anyone who asks me, I say, how you became a diplomat? My answer traditionally is I fell backwards into it. Happened to walk by a booth at a career fair and here we are. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the experience has been evolving over time. Whenever, whenever I joined, um, I wasn't married yet. I was engaged, but I wasn't married. And then you know, we got overseas a little bit and it, then my wife joined on. We were, we were, so we're what we call a tandem couple. So now the mm -hmm. situation is evolving where we're trying to find jobs at embassies that can, can host both of us. And then three years ago, we, we, we had our first child. So, you know, now we're looking at schools and, we're, you know, you know, that's an interesting assignment, but the school there is not great, or we want them to be able to do this or that. So um, I would say that's kind of how it's evolving is, is kind of taking the foreign service experience and, and trying to drag it along with our own life milestones. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We, next question about visas. Uh, I heard you might have to process up to 200 visas a day, I'm guessing in, uh, at some posts. Um, how do you get used to that? Yeah, so we, we there are embassies that are that are kind of designated high volume. Where, like you know, I think in in Brazil, for example, uh, where consular officers are are doing. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't have to do that many. Well, I was in Belize. I had to do like a hundred a day. Um, so hundred a day. That's a lot. Uh, you do like a hundred interviews a day, but not every day of the week. But I have talked to colleagues who who were in these kind of high high volume posts, and it can I think it can take a toll. I mean, it really, a lot of it depends on your what that embassy's refusal rate is. I think there's a big difference between processing a lot of visas and, and giving and granting them, and processing a lot of visas and then like turning people down to the middle of the day. And you know those jobs do exist. Um, I think you know in situations like that you rely on your colleagues to be able to to vent. You know, I mean, cases are, are private, but you, know, you can kind of talk gener like in generalities about these cases and trends you're seeing. Just being able to 
rely on each other or, you know, sometimes you have a really funky case and you can't get through it in the, mm. you know, supposed to do two minutes per case. So, you know, you go a little bit longer and then your colleagues are going to step in and do one or two extra for you at the end of the day, because, you know, it's, it's all a, it's all a team sport. Didn't you say that you kind of um, got to be, I don't know if renowned or infamous um, in Belize for visa denial? Deni I don't know if denial, uh, but yeah. you kind of yeah. were recognizable. I didn't say that. Thank you. The uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So the, the, my, my, my story here is I am, I'm relatively tall. I'm above average height, about six foot four. And the average Belizean is way shorter than me. Also a darker complexion. I'm very white, as you can see. So in Belize, I stand out like a sore thumb. You can see me coming a mile away. And, you know, shortly after I arrived there, you know, we're saying no to folks. Belize is not a very big country. I started getting recognized. So it was not uncommon for me to be at the grocery store out and about in town. And people who, whose face, face I kind of vaguely remember, they're coming up to the, hey, do you remember me? And my answer was no, even if I do, kind of. And it was always, you, know, you, you turned down my visa. You said I didn't have you know, family ties where the situation was. And like, Here's my family, look at this. And then just this really awkward situation where you, you know, there's a standard line. It's like, you're always eligible to reapply. We recommend you not reapply unless you have new evidence to present. And was this know. part of consular training too? Teaching you how to? No, I don't recall the part where they say you're going to get called out in public. I hope it is now, but it wasn't whenever I was there. <laughs> Okay, I have one more question about consular stuff and then we'll switch um, tracks a little bit. What did you find more most frustrating about consular work? Most frustrating about consular work. Man, I hate to say it, and there's any IT folks out there, I'm sorry, but whenever I was a consular officer, the, the systems we use, like the computer systems, mm. are archaic. Um, I think they're starting to, to migrate to new systems now, but uh, you know, the databases that we kind of have to log our information into were insanely old, they would break down. Um, they were not user friendly at all. I mean, I would say whenever I was doing visa interviews, at least 15 to 20% of my time was just like dealing with the computers. Like, okay, now I'm clicking on this and I'm typing that in and now I'm clicking over there and I'm clicking deny and now I have to do this pop up. Um, so I think that was very frustrating to be, you know, United States of America, a powerhouse, but using the you know, 1980s um, computer software. Having worked in government, that kind of tracks actually. Yeah. Um, so what made you specifically choose to become an economic officer? Uh, when you had, you could have been I, political or something else. Yeah, I, whenever I decided I wanted to become a foreign service officer, I, yeah, it was a point where I had, I had to make a choice. What was the cone I wanted to go into? It was consular, mm -hmm. political, economic, and public diplomacy. Um, being an engineer, I very much enjoy science and technology. Mm -hmm. There is a kind of like a subset of portfolios to economic officers. It's called the ESTH portfolio. It's like environmental science, technology, and health. And that is why I just chose to be an economic officer because mm -hmm. I thought um, I would love to cover those portfolios abroad. I had the science technology trying to, you know, kind of shorten the gap between the policy folks and the people who are doing the technology and the science. Uh, I, I thought, and I still do believe that I can be a good, a good conduit between that. That's great. So are econ officers the only officers that get opportunities to do commercial work in the country? I would say it depends. It, traditionally, yes, I think. I mean, there are, there are commercial officers, uh, forgive me, from the Foreign Commercial Service from the Department of Commerce, but they are rare. There's not very many of those. Um, you know, so I do commercial work in, in Latvia, but we have a, there's a, a regional foreign commercial services officer uh, who sits in another country and, and kind of oversees my work here to make sure that you know, I'm not violating any kind of commercial laws and things like that. Traditionally, though, it's my experience that economic officers are going to hold the commercial portfolio at an embassy. Okay. So next 
question. Um, I think we answered a couple of these. What, I, this is now sort of broadly about entering the foreign service. Are there any tips or you think any specific skills people might need in order to be su successful applicants for the foreign service? Like languages, uh, I'm guessing not everyone needs to be an engineer. Yeah, I, I see this question from time to time. And the answer I think is that you don't need, you don't need anything. I think you need a high school diploma and to be able to pass mm -hmm. the tests. I think there are a lot of really good resources out there, both on the Department of State's, you know, careers.state.gov website, that kind of work through practice exam and describe the process. And you've got really vibrant communities. Like I think there's a foreign service subreddit where folks are very helpful. It might be a discord group where you can kind of pop in and ask questions. There are books to read to kind of give you that holistic overview of, of history and current events and things like that that you might encounter. But the oral assessments are, you know, there's very various shades of exercises you do there that you can kind of think through in your mind and work on teamwork and collaboration and negotiation. Um, you know, I think it's very rare for people to pass on their first go. So my guess always don't get discouraged, but I, anyone who asks me like, what do I do for a living? I, I make sure at the very end, I say, you should apply too. It's great. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of, former lawyers and political science folks floating around and they are great and they are valuable. But I think the, the foreign service also needs people from all types of backgrounds, science, yeah. technology, liberal arts, um, just to round out the experience and you know be representative of the United States as a whole. Yeah. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Um, all right, this is maybe up your, up your alley. Do you see a role for AI in consular work? In consular work? Sort of up your alley, I guess. Do I see? I mean, I think the technology is there. I think you could definitely dump successful, the, the applications of successful applicants into like an AI model and train it on what, like a successful app, like what does a good traveler look like in Belize? Yeah dump all those applications in but without you, know, you you would need to have guardrails on the system and I, I don't think those are kind of built in yet uh, language these kind of large language models are new uh, regulations about privacy and security are still ongoing um, but you know maybe there's a there's a world where it kind of you let the, the AI take the first pass and say you know kind of give them a shade of green of you know there are Sadly to say, there are in certain situations like obvious no's on, on visas. So uh, maybe there's a way where you can kind of filter those out and, and, and save officers time to be able to focus on the other cases. I don't know. It's a great idea. I'd love but, to see it implemented. I know. Um, but you're not worried about AI taking a consul officer's job, are you? No. <laughs> not yet. Um, okay. To, uh, I'm just looking at the time. We have a couple more questions we can go through. Okay, so um, question about continuing education. So have you considered doing any sort of continuing education since becoming an FSO? And if so, how has it been uh, received or supported? Or do you know of someone? There are, I think, so I have done, I've, I've done online classes. I've not taken just some, you know, I, I, I like doing commercial work. And but I don't have a business background. Uh, so I took a couple, I took on my own dime some business classes online just mm -hmm. to be able to kind of be able to talk to these companies a little bit more intelligently. Um, so that definitely exists. And I think it largely depends on your boss, which I would hope would be supportive of you. Um, so that's on one aspect, you're kind of doing it on your own thing in your own time. There's also a lot of opportunities within the Department of State to, for continuing education. There are a lot of, um, um, gosh, what's the proper word for like military colleges, like a Naval War College and things like that. You yeah. can go there and get a master's degree. There are programs to go study at I think Stanford and Princeton. And every, every year the department chooses a couple of folks to go get masters of public policy and things like that. You know, in those situations, you're, you know, you're paid your full salary. You're, you're kind of 
just temporarily placed over there to study and learn. And then you have to sign like a continuing service agreement. You know, you can't come back and, and quit and really have to stay for three years or else you have to like pay back the, the cost of the program. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a lot of really good opportunities out there. And I think sadly, a lot of them are also underbid. Um, so they're, they're there and right for the picking. That's great. Okay, so last question. Um, the question goes, what does consular affairs do when people ask for money to go home? I guess maybe they, their wallet got stolen or something and they have to go home. But then I wanted to, on top of that, piggyback and maybe say a few words about evacuations and what happens when something is happening and American citizens have to get out of there. Sure. Um, the United, the embassies can give loans to destitute Americans. And we did do it relatively routinely in Belize. Um, we don't just give out money though. There are a few hoops as any good bureaucracy to jump through to, to, to get that money. Uh, usually you have to, you have to proven or you have to have proven that you don't have money. You can't get access to money. And usually that's done by like my wallet was stolen. I don't have my debit card. Yeah. I lost everything. Um, and then you also have to try to get money from the United States. And usually in Belize, what we did is we would take them into our privacy booth, um, let them use our phone for free to call back the United States to get a hold of a family member, try mm -hmm. to get them to wire some money down. That was the, the, the next step. So proving you don't have any, try at least on, you know, X, you know maybe three or four times to, to get money sent down. And then if you, if you're unsuccessful or no one pick up or sadly no one wanted to give you the money to, to get back, um, then the United States government could issue a loan. And the way that works is we, we, we end up issuing kind of a temporary, gosh, uh, the specifics are foggy, but basically we put like a hold on their passport that says that, you know, this person now owes the United States government and you have to pay us back. And there are certain mechanisms by which we try to collect or make sure that they can't use their passport and enter or leave the country until they do pay the government back. And most people do, I think. It, 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 there are certain situations where you might have someone who has mental health issues who kind of, and it did happen in Belize, like literally wandered from America to Belize um, with nothing, I don't know how, and then needed to get back and had, um, yeah, and then it had no family to help take care of. It was a crazy situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that just came back to me. Um, so there are certain situations where like someone's mom or family member won't, won't um, wire yeah. money down. And those are sad, but they happen. The government can help. The same thing is like, if you don't have a hotel room, you know, we'll, the embassy might have a good relationship with local hotels to say, hey, can you please, this person is truly destitute. Can they have a room for the night? Or we can add that on to the loan that we're giving them for mm -hmm. a plane to take it back or whatever. The little extra money for the hotel room and money to eat on until we can get them on a plane. So okay. yes, it is possible. I have never actually been a part of an evacuation. Thankfully, I'm sure my time is coming. Um, but I will say, you know, in, in Belize, one thing we did as part of the American Citizen Services portfolio is we would host hurricane town halls, like hurricane preparedness. Like, mm -hmm. hey, American living on the coast of Belize, hurricanes happen. Have you thought about what you're gonna do? Um, and we kind of explain what the embassy might do, um, you know, what resources we have, which are extremely limited to be able to help people. I mean, if a hurricane hits Belize, the embassy is gonna do what it can to help Americans. But if like roads are shut, you know, we don't, again, we don't have helicopter. We can't fly to the coast to help people. So we always encourage people to think about their own emergency preparedness kits and plans and have them sign up for our notification system. Mm -hmm. that says, hey, a hurricane's coming, you should leave. Or there's a lot of violence, a lot of political violence, or there's a terrorist organization on the, on the border. We, we would recommend you evacuating and things like that. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. I think that's all the questions we have time for today. Thanks again, Andrew. This was great. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list, you can always email us at events at ASA.org and you'll get info on all the latest programs and resources that we have happening. So thanks again, Andrew. Um, you. You've definitely deserved the rest of the night off. <laughs> <laughs> <I> appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, everyone. See you next time.